the field is choked. Get out. Go to where your knowledge will be needed. Don't always follow the big industries. Start mm-hmm. from somewhere, a, a little place, or you know, a little industry. Do wonders, and you make a great name for yourself. All right. So, so that's my second advice. Search for where your ideas and knowledge will be sellable, will be needed, and move there. All right. And um, thirdly, if you cannot create a job, if you cannot move out of your comfort zone, you have PhD, and you 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 know you want to get a job, start lower. Hey, 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 Entre Leaders. Happy Wednesday and welcome to the 34th episode of the Leaders Lab podcast. I am thrilled for today's episode. Um, I, I brought back a popular person, a popular guest from, from a show that we had. And actually, I'm not just saying that. YouTube says that this is one of the most watched videos out of all of my Leaders Lab playlists. Um, and so I am, I'm honored to have my dear friend, my business partner, and a fellow colleague, Dr. Frank Larby, back with us. Hello, Dr. Larby. Welcome back to the Leaders Lab podcast. Hello, Dr. Charity Campbell. Thank you for bringing me back. Yeah, thank ah, you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And so just in case you're trying to figure out, like, who is this guy? Like, I don't remember him from the first one because you didn't watch it. So let me just tell you. Dr. Larby is a full-time associate researcher in international and comparative education at South China Normal University, right here in China and Guangzhou. And he's also an adjunct lecturer at the Guangdong Polytechnic Normal University. That's a lot of words to say. Um, But he obtained his Doctor of Philosophy degree, his PhD in international and comparative education. Um, educational leadership as well, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, educational leadership and policy. Okay, and he he actually obtained that from Beijing Normal University in Beijing, China. And of course, he is a researcher. Um, I'm excited because we are currently working on a couple of different projects together. So this is really interesting and exciting. But uh, so I just, without further ado, I want to say welcome back once again, Dr. Larby. Thank you so much for agreeing to be back on the show. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me back. And it's an honor. And I'm great to hear that our first show was the most watched show on YouTube. That's really great. It's really an honor. Yeah, we did it. (laughs) (laughs) No, seriously, it's one of my, it's it's in the top three videos um, that are most watched on my channel. And so that says a lot that to me. And so when I saw that, I'm like, okay, we have to do something else because there obviously there are people who are interested in knowing what happens after PhD, after doctor of science, after doctor of education, doctor of management. And so, um, you know, I, I, I contacted you yesterday. I was like, Hey, listen, we have got to talk about, we got to talk about this, uh, job opportunities after PhD. And the reason why I said that is um, there was an article that was written in 2018. Dr. Isaiah Hankel wrote an article quoting statistics from the National Science Foundation. Now check this out. He said 80% of life science PhDs, specifically Mm -hmm. PhDs in the the area of life science, they end up unemployed or in low paying postdoc training positions. But then The research goes on to say that 60% of all PhDs, so all terminal degrees, all PhDs, 60% end up unemployed or in low paying postdoc positions. And so the article continues on, like, you know, explaining a little bit more about that. And then, and then it basically summarizes, it comes down to say that the only way to have job security is to take matters into your own hands. So what do you think about these statistics? Relating to what happens globally, I, I'm not surprised that kind of statistics is out. 
I wouldn't doubt it, you know, because it's not far from the truth and reality, you know. So that is exactly what is going on, you know. And that's why on the first show, if you can recall, I made mention that um, getting PhD, it's not uh, necessarily a guarantee a guarantor that you, you get a job or you get a uh, your dream job, you know, to do. So um, more is entailed in getting PhD. So I'm not surprised at all. Uh, at all that this statistics is there to speak to reality and uh, we can see it you know we have friends and you know classmates we all graduated together some still looking for jobs you know after three years you know <laughs> or even more and some are still you know doing jobs that are not uh, qualified jobs for them to do but I mean they don't have any option you know so they have to grab them like that so yeah it's it happens it's, it's a reality, yeah. So did you have any difficulties finding a job once you completed your degree? Um, no, I didn't have any difficulties, you know, yeah, as some people are facing. But I, I always tell people, look, I, I say this again and again, and I'm going to say it again. I think I said it on the first show, and I'm going to say it again. Um, getting PhD without a plan, an absolute plan towards your PhD is useless. PhD is not an evidence that you are smart. PhD is not an evidence that you are highly educated. Education doesn't happen in a classroom. I say this every day, right? Education, and I threw this question to you. What are you doing now? What do you know now? How, how much percentage of them were taught in a classroom? You, you, you're doing so many things you didn't learn in a classroom. You know so many things now you didn't learn in a classroom. Quality education doesn't happen in a classroom. Or quality education is not, it's not you know, uh, embedded in a certificate. All right? So you would ha if you, before you get a PhD or before you even think of um, getting enrolled to get a PhD, you should have a holistic plan of your life. And in that case, you will finish and will not struggle to get a job to do. We have so many PhD candidates who have never even presented in one international conference. We have PhD candidates who have not even written a research or even published in research. In that case, how are you selling yourself to the world? All right. So if you're going to do your PhD or go through a PhD program like, you know, master students or undergraduate students, what difference will you make? When you finish up or when you, when, you, when you gradually or when you finally complete your PhD, you will join the unemployment queue, same as the master's students. You join the unemployment queue, same as the undergraduate students. So as a PhD, you should do something different. You should do something remarkable, something that will push you out there, that will sell you. Do something to market yourself as a PhD candidate or PhD student. Don't finish before you marketize yourself. Don't get a certificate before you tell the world, hey, the world, I am Dr. Love. I'm Dr. Frank. I'm done with my PhD. Here am, am I. Give me a... No, no one is going to mind you. We need people of high quality intellectualism. We need people who can do something outside their certificate, who can reason and solve problems on the desk. And this is what okay. you have to prove yourself. Whilst okay. you st you're still a candidate or student, prove yourself to the world through conferences, through papers, through ideas, through webinars, through, through seminars, through every possible means. Prove yourself. So what about the student who is currently in their doctoral program or prospects who are saying, you know, well, what a, how can I find these opportunities? Nobody's telling me about these opportunities um, to go and make myself you know, known. I mean, I'm already working on my dissertation, my thesis, some, some people are also working full time. Some people, I, I was working full time. I was actually working two jobs while I was getting my doctorate. So some people may not, you know, unless it's handed to them and I'm not trying to give you know, us a pass or excuses, but I just want to know, were those opportunities given to you for research or, or did you find them on your own? Very good question. You know, we, fortunately for, for this current 
um, epic of globalization, uh, information, it's, it's rampant, it's coming out there due to technological advancement. So you don't have to wait for someone to bring information to your desk or to knock your door to give you pieces of information. As the scripture says, ask and shall be given unto you. Seek and shall find, knock and shall be open. You have to search for information. Do not, do not sit down to be fed as a PhD candidate. Come on. You are, you are at a level whereby you should be more innovative, creative, you know, and impactful. So if you're not getting the information, search on Google, ask Google, right? Be, be, be more open out there. Social media is, is there, all right? Um, in your universities, have a close contact with your professors, not only your supervisor, but with other professors, you know, so that when they see your, your, your energy or your uh, activeness, if there's any opportunity or chances, you'll be the first to be on their mind that, oh, let me inform this person. He might be interested. He likes presenting conferences. He, he, he likes doing this. He likes organizing this. He likes this. So you be the first on people's mind when such kind of information comes. But if you are just there minding your own business, no. I mean, who is going to call you? Who is going to search for you? That is what I'm mm-hmm. saying that it depends on how you position yourself. It depends on how you search and dig for information. It depends on how you connect yourself and make yourself relevant to the world. Whilst um, um, in your PhD program as a candidate or as a student. You know, so I wouldn't say if I was in my country, I would have been unemployed by now. No, I wouldn't say that. You know, you never know the opportunities that would have um, um, come out, you know, as a result of sitting in my country. Right. Yeah. Even I would say China would have been more difficult for me to get a job than in my country. Right. Because my country is English is, is, is English speaking country. Right. So every institution, you know, I can teach any program related you know, to my fields in, in the field of social science, uh, of, you know, more than 100 institutions, higher education institutions that I, I could have, you know, getting changed there. Comparing to China, you know, it's not English speaking country. So comparatively, the opportunity here is kind of limited, you know. Yeah. However, uh, it limited in, in the sense that China is not English speaking country. Therefore, all programs or most of the programs are taught in Chinese, not English. And, you know, my Chinese is not to that level right yeah Am to be I? able to teach right <laughs> and uh we don't have many international international uh high educational institutions all right to to open doors for foreigners so very limited and you know you know coming from <laughs> I, I mean you know you, you you are you are here so you understand like job opportunities are more open to westerners yeah. You know, yeah. Done, well, that, done. that was one of the reasons why I asked that yeah. question because for for me, yeah. it it was actually easier to get a job here in China. But of course, well, let me let me change that <laughs> because and I, I actually I don't know if I told you this. I feel like I have in one of our conversations, but I don't know if I told you this. When I uh, me coming to China, I, I wasn't even teaching in the university. I wasn't teaching anything for what I went to school for, like. I started with with ESL, English as a second language. It was my foot in the door. And honestly, it was I had had gone through a really 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 challenging period as soon as I finished my doctorate of trying to find a job in my field. Um I remember that uh I I had a promising position at at one of the local uh historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs. Um, mm-hmm. in my city and the entire thing just fell through and it actually it was so discouraging to me because mm-hmm. you know I just I saw it like this is it's a you know it's a world-renowned university here I am I just completed my doctorate a month ago and here I have this opportunity and documents paperwork everything was lagging from my university to there so I actually missed out on the opportunity. And Dr. Larby, let me just tell you that my 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 pastors, my mom, and people closest to me, they knew about it. And it put me in such a dark place. I, I was so discouraged and disappointed because I had my hopes up for, for finally, I just finished. I have a doctor in front of my name and I'm about to be, you know, this university professor. And none of it went through. I mean, 
none of it went through. And so um, then I started applying for things and I started hearing, oh, but you're overqualified or, or you don't have enough experience. How was I supposed to get that? This is this is part of, you know, the question where you were talking about go out and do your research and, you know, things like that. I'm like, well, how was I supposed to get experience when I'm in my doctoral program? So everything just fell through. And I ended up working at a community college teaching English. And then that was, you know, kind of the segue, the rest of every, you know, the rest is history. But I ended up coming to China, teaching for a year, knew that it was time for me to leave, moved to Beijing started not, not teaching. I wasn't teaching. And that's where we met, you know, not teaching. And then I ended up moving to Dali and where here's this opportunity, but it didn't happen right away for me. So we, we have like these different, it's a different dichotomy because you got out of your doctoral program and bam, you had a job like waiting for you. And me, I got out of mine in America, by the way, let's just, for all of my Americans who are listening, and everyone's like, oh, I just got to get to America. It's the land of the promise and everything. <laughs> Listen, when you get out of, when you get out and you have a high degree, unless you did like Dr. Larby is saying, you know, you, I guess, made yourself be exceptionally seen and you make these connections prior to graduating, you're going to end up like 60% of the rest of these PhDs in America where you are unemployed. And it's, it's a, oof, it's a terrible thing to feel. So that's why I asked you that question about your home country um, versus here, because for me, it wasn't happening, boo. Yeah. So uh, as as I said, um, uh, with with the, the thing with China is um, uh, okay. Let me tell you how I got my job, and probably you will have a better understanding of. It's a long story, but I'll try to cut it short within a minute. Uh, I told you I like international conference and even. Uh, amongst my cohort, I think I tend to be corrected. You know, if any one of them is listening to me, I hope they will not fight me for this. But I think I'm the one who, you know, I'm most of them traveled for conferences, but I went out for conferences more. You know, I, I don't, I, I can't recall, you know, anyone, you know, really traveling out on their own expense, you know. So I traveled out of China to other countries, South Korea. Philippines, Cambodia, Hong Kong, and even in the United States of America, you know, for conferences. And this was like every year, sometimes twice a year, and my own money, right? This is an investment I was doing, right? So I have to go through the pain, first of all, writing the paper, submitting the paper to the conference, whether they will accept or not, it's up to them, you know. But fortunately for me, like all my papers were getting accepted, I mean, which made me feel proud about myself that, yeah, I mean, I have something good in, in the paper. So it, it kind of gave me the energy. And every single conference I have attended has benefited me one way or the other. You know, like the one I attended in the Philippines, I got a deal with uh, a university in Malaysia to collaborate on a research, a book research together. And, you know, I, I did my part. They paid me a little money, but, you know, it's, it's good. In South Korea, you know, we went there, submitted a paper, and we it was a national competition actually. That was twice, you know, and we won. Wow. We won out of two times with my research team. In wow. um so the last one I went before getting a job was in Cambodia. And that is where I met a professor. He was interested in my research ideas. We talked after uh, my presentation, and he said, Guess what? I'm a professor in this university would want to join. I'm like, Hey, come on. I'm in, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> but, but at the time I had already started with applications and stuff like that, you know, and, uh, and coincidentally I had dropped an application in the, in his university, but I didn't get any response yet. Right. Oh, wow. So when I met, I, I didn't know him. He just talked to me because he liked my presentation. So after, after, I mean, after I presented, we talked and I said, okay, you're from this university. I've dropped an application. I haven't heard from anyone. I mean, for about one and a half months. I said, oh, really? And, you know, fortunately, the person who received my email was also at a conference. He went to call her. We all sat down. She apologized that she didn't reply to me because, you know, a lot of emails were on her because it was at a, at a peak time of applications, you know. So the professor says, well, I like French research idea. Get him on. I'm going to work with him. And that was it. 
Wow. Now, okay, wait. So that is, first of all, that is nothing but a whole bunch of favor all over your life. I just want to let you know that like that is crazy favor. But in order to get to that place of favor, you actually had to position yourself. So one thing that you said was you invested in the opportunity. It was a lot of money that you paid out of pocket for each mm -hmm. of these things. Right. And so now I understand why you were sharing with us before, like get out and do something, um, you know, get out and, and find these conferences and, you know, and so also, even if you're not a current student, but maybe you were teaching and you, you know, you were laid off. Maybe you don't have a job anymore. You were fired. Something happened because of COVID. You know, you were terminated. Or maybe you're just in between this, this teaching path or you're trying to find your way. Um, according to what Dr. Larby is saying, he's saying, go visit Brother Google. Okay, go visit Brother Google and search for um, academic conferences that may be in your field. And, and honestly, even now, it should probably be easier because most conferences are still done virtually. I just right. uh, I just presented at a virtual conference a few months ago and that put me on the radar for some people. So, I mean, and you don't have to pay when it's yeah. virtual, Like you're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. You're literally at home. Please make sure you are dressed from head to toe, though, because if you stand up and you got your pajamas on, then nobody's going to hire you, honey. Nobody's yeah. going to hire you with your pajamas on. So, so, some will have suit on oh, with boxer shorts. shorts. <laughs> Ain't nobody about to hire you. And we're like, sir, we see everything going on at the bottom. This, I'm sorry, you're not a good fit for our organization. <laughs> But um, that was, wow. So I, I, I never knew that. And um, that just, oh, it makes so much sense. So especially if you're a student now, it's, I mean, how else will you be discovered or seen if you're not present? You have to go and, to and where these know, places are. Well, the thing is, um, even as I'm talking about my, my I started with, um, and Beijing Normal University, you know, you know, is the best university of education and humanities in China. So we do organize a lot of high level international conferences on campus. So that is where I started from getting experience of presentation, you know, standing in front of uh, multicultural um, students or academics, you know, presenting my research ideas and stuff like that. So you got to start from somewhere to the point that. Uh, my final year of PhD, the, the, the year that I think 2018, yeah, um, there is, you can say this American Educational Research Association era, American Educational Research is the largest educational um, conference in the world, the largest. Sometimes they have a level about 15,000 participants in Seoul, right? Wow. And this is a conference that is really difficult for your people to be accepted. Look, you have highly intellectual, you know, professors, academics from all over the world submitting paper to this conference. So the, 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 the you know, space is very limited, right? So for your people to be accepted it should be really high there. And fortunately for me, the first time I applied, I got it. And I didn't just got a conference. I also got sponsorship, which was a miracle, <laughs> you know? Wait, you know, I got a sponsorship from Like, what was your a miracle. What about because this is like i mean like i mean something normal you know and i'm not i'm not a genius or i'm not highly intel no 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 I'm, I'm just a normal person you know right but the thing is um if you're a phd candidate or student you might have written a lot of terminal or semester papers mm. what are you doing with these semester papers what i did is I, I told myself that I'm not going to spend months writing a semester paper just to get an A or to get 90, all right? But I'm going to write them very well, or even if they are not as well as publishable or to present in conference, after the assignment or after the this, this semester uh, uh, um, paper, I'm going to take my time to polish it so that I can do something with it. So most of these conferences I attended, I didn't magically write a research. They were my assignments I did in school. Wow. And some of these assignments are research assignments. So you have to collect data, analyze, and stuff like that, right? So <clears throat> I spent my time and made sure I do a high-quality semester paper so that when I submit to a conference, 
it to be highly acceptable. Or when I submit to a journal, at least, even if they will ask me to do corrections, at the end, they will accept it. And that's how I do it. So pay attention to assignments you do. And every assignment counts. Every single assignment you do counts. Because that is what is going to relatively define you or define your major or your expertise. So if you say, I'm uh, my expert or my expertise is in higher education or primary education, it means that you might have done series of research on that. You can't tell me this is your expert area and you've done only one research. Who believe you? Mm. Mm. All right. So every assignment counts. Take your time, do it. And don't just do it because it's an assignment. Do it because you want to project it on a global stage. Listen here. You just preached the whole sermon. Like, <laughs> that is... N- now listen, because I, I know I have students who are currently, they're going through their PhD program right now. And I'm trying to tell you what he is saying is the gospel truth. You hear me? What he is telling you. And I wish that someone would have said this, these exact words to me because, listen, some of my assignments, and I, I had so many classes. And the thing is, don't, when you finish your program, don't throw your documents away. Don't throw your assignments away. I still have every last assignment that I did. I've been thinking about going back to my assignments and turning them into articles to submit. Right. And going back and look at the ones that, you know, have had, maybe it has like, you know, I mean, because these assignments were really, really, really long. They were, they were extensive. And if you put in the research work, I mean, why can't you do something more with it? So I I love that. I love that. And, and also that, that does help you to be marketable because Mm -hmm. institutions and universities, which you and I both know, they are looking for someone who is going to publish, who is already published, who can continue to publish because that's the thing. Like it's, you know, publishing is the name of the game. Publish so, or perish. Publish so, or perish. Publish or perish. That was one of the right. things that, you know, you brought up uh, last time. And so, right. wow, that, that is, that's gold. Listen, if you're listening to this podcast right now, if you're listening to the audio version of this, or if you're watching us um, and you see these, gorgeous faces on we just <laughs> we just we just want to tell you right now that while you are in your program find ways to maximize it because right. this is this is the thing that will set you apart so this is why we're coming to you today but what Dr. Larby is telling you you should pay him for <laughs> You should pay him for what he is sharing with you cuz this is this is golden this is golden so what would you what would you say to someone who already has their degree right they and they are currently unemployed for whatever reason they're currently unemployed um and they are just they are discouraged like they're listening to us right now or they're watching us right now and some of what you said they're like okay maybe but then they still have that they still have that doubt like the job market is just terrible. There's nothing out here for me. Now I got to go get a job in, in something, you know, a field that I didn't even, I didn't even go to school for. So what would you say to them? Like what type of encouraging message uh, without, without, you know, because you know how you get, when you encourage people sometimes you'd be like, <laughs> let me, okay, y'all, I'm, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to take it easy here. Please yeah, take it so easy on the people. I'm going to take it easy here. All right, so to my dear brothers and sisters who have PhDs and still jobless, first advice, create one. Because you've gained gained too much knowledge to be unemployed. Look, you've gone through kindergarten, primary education, middle school, senior high, first degree, second degree, PhD. You're way much educated. To get employed, right? Deploy yourself. Create one if you don't have it. Put ideas together. You, 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 you have this certificate, right? You've gone through article writing and probably publication and stuff like that. With PhD, you can edit papers. You can proofread. You can give advice as to how people can polish their paper, right? Create an editing institution. One or two people bring bring your ideas together, 
All right. We have so many students, you know, who want to learn or who if you want to polish the assignment through quality proofreading, editing and stuff like that. All right. Create a campaign, register it, you know, market it, you know, capture, have a very good captivating name. All right. I always say I catch it, right? I I catch you or I arrest them. a name that when someone sees it is going to raise their eyes and their attention. All right. Design a logo, get it highly, you know, professional logo, professional, you know, uh, um, uh, marketing. And we have social media, post it everywhere. You see people start contacting you with their papers and stuff. You've created a job for yourself. All right. Secondly, um, if you have PhD, um, in any field that you, you study, look in, in your environment, have a critical assessment. Is this knowledge helpful? Or is this knowledge uh, needed in my environment? Ask yourself this critical question. Search, ask, seek for information. Do people need this knowledge? If they don't, we are in a global world where the entire world has become like a village. All right, throw your applications out of your comfort zone, out of your environment. China is recruiting every year. Um, um, probably um, Middle East is recruiting. There are some universities in Africa that need certain talents. Get out of your comfort zone because we are in, we are in an era where everywhere is home. You can make everywhere <laughs> home. Where it. everywhere. It, it's livable. I love it. So, as far as there's no missiles flying over your roof. <laughs> okay. It's That's livable. Not <laughs> That's not right. home. That's not home. But we have so, so many countries that are very peaceful. In Asia, in Africa, in Europe, in, in the America, there are so many countries that are very peaceful. Search for countries that need your knowledge and ideas. For example, if you live in China and you study something about um, black history or something that has to do with racism and stuff, who needs this idea in China? China doesn't have history of, you know, Africans or, you know, excuse my words, you know, black people and stuff like that. So what are you going to do with this idea here in this country? So in this situation, you have to search for countries that have issues with racism and black histories and stuff like that. All right. If you, if you, if you study something like environmental science, there are so many countries that struggle with environmental problems. If you go to Africa, there are thousands of jobs. If you go to some countries in Asia, thousands of jobs. In Europe, in America, thousands of jobs. So if you are in China and you study this program, all right, and we have thousands of environmental scientists. The field is choked. Get out. Go to where your knowledge will be needed. Don't always follow the big industries. Start mm -hmm. from somewhere, a, a little place, or you know, a little industry. Do wonders, and you make a great name for yourself. All right? So... So that's my second advice. Search for where your ideas and knowledge will be sellable, will be needed, and move there. All right? And um, thirdly, if you're unemployed with your PhD, if you cannot create a job, as I just gave, um, this is free consultation. It, it's worth like thousands of dollars, but you know. Very free for today. Okay. It's All right. free. Amen. If you can, sorry. If you cannot create a job, if you cannot move out of your comfort zone, you have PhD and you 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 know you want to get a job, start lower. Start lower. No, don't say I have a PhD, so I'm gonna apply job with PhD. The human resource manager or the, the, the CEO who is gonna read your CV is probably a dropout. <laughs> or even better. Has a, a, a first degree, and you are coming with PhD. Come on, go with your bachelor's. And if you go and you do wonders, then you reveal your true certificates. Mm 
for promotions. All right. And let me say this again. PhD does not determine how knowledgeable or wise you are. Any foolish person can get a PhD. Any stupid guy can get a PhD. The difference is what you do with your certificate. Mm. The difference is the remarkable impact and contribution, the critical, the innovative contribution you are adding to knowledge, you are adding to, to society to improve. That makes the difference. It's not your certificate. Certificate is just a paper. So don't think and don't be too excited that I have my PhD. I know some people who have PhD, but they are poor. They can't even build a house. They are poor. So what are you talking about, PhD? Get the knowledge. That is what is happening to many companies out there. They look for experienced people, not people with papers. If I have a company, I will employ people who are experienced. If you have PhD but have zero experience, you are nothing to me. That is why I said that if you are a student, expose yourself, learn, grab the knowledge, tell the world that I am here. So before you graduate, you are known by the world. Do you mm. think most of the international conferences I, I attended, meeting professors, shaking their hands, taking pictures with them, meeting people, have, I have like contacts, like, like, like uh, business cards, like be like this. That I can take and, you know, write to anyone because they know me, know them. They saw me presenting. I heard them presenting as well. So this is how we build a connection and networking. Network yourself. Connect yourself. Tell the world that I am here. I can do things. And so, most importantly, free service is very important. You have PhD. Give free service to people underneath your qualification. Mentor them. When I was in Beijing Normal University, I used to organize free workshops for students. Right? Research workshops, how to design theoretical framework, and so many things. Even now, as a, a lecturer in my university, I do free workshops that are not part of what I'm supposed to do. But I do it freely. And not only for my university, other universities as well. Free. They don't pay. And this is how you can sell yourself out there. It might be free today, but one thing you don't know, you are adding value to yourself. So all the free things you're doing in composition, or they will accumulate to build a remarkable value on yourself. And when you have this value, marketable value, you don't have to move. Just sit there. People will start calling you. Can you do this for us? Can you do this for us? And now you place your charge. Okay, I'll do it. But um, one hour, you're going to pay $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. You place a value on yourself. My dear, be creative, be innovative. Our brains have billions of brain cells that we can use to do something Motivate yourself. No one is going to motivate you. You have to motivate yourself and do the undoable. Try to see the unseeable and move. Become unmovable so that you grab the chance to move the world along with you. Thank you. Oh, he's such a preacher. <laughs> I wanted to clap and say, hey, man. But you know, <laughs> I wanted to be like, yes, hey, man, where is the offering plate? Listen, I think <laughs> I think that that is the perfect place for us to put a pin on this conversation. We could actually talk about this so much, but when you were talking, you gave me another idea. Of course, we're going to have a part three. You gave me another idea. This time, we're going to focus on PhD students and how to get experience before you graduate. And so we are going to, that's going to be coming up. This is so, this is critical. This is critical information. And again, Dr. Larby is sharing this with you for free. Huh? For free, free, free. today. Because in the future, it ain't gonna be free anymore, huh? Oh. We are going to dart. <laughs> we are going to dart a hefty for now price. It's free. When we for get now to it's 50, free. 
when we get to 60 years old on retirement where we cannot do active job, that's where we'll be charging billions. Billions. <laughs> <laughs> charging a lot of money because we can't do anything else. So I think <laughs> that we can continue this and we can, you know, we can we can do this. Uh, continue on with this. That's sure. Part three for next week. If you are available. I know you're so busy. For you, uh, I am available. <laughs> that's that's what I'm talking about. And I did not pay him to say that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we support great people. So Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, we support each other's initiatives. And this is, but this is so, wow, this is powerful. All right. So make sure you come right. back and tune into the 35th episode. Again, Dr. Frank Larby, thank you so much for joining us on the Leaders Lab podcast. This is your home now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank next you. Week. Dr. Charlie You're... Combo for having me on the show. Thank no you. No problem. All right. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in once again. Listen, this was amazing. I did not expect it to be this informative and this great, but I'm super excited. And I just want to say thank you guys so much for rocking with us. Don't forget, if you are listening to this, subscribe. Uh, make sure you uh, rate us. Give us a comment. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like button. Also. Ding that notification bell so you can receive notifications every time a new episode is on. So, and share, 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 share this as much as you possibly can. This is awesome and amazing. And I thank you guys for rocking with me. So thank you so much for tuning in to the 34th episode of the Leaders Lab podcast. And I'll see you guys next week in the lab. Thank you for listening to the Leaders Lab podcast. Visit our website at www.drcharitytv.com.